Joseph Young Card and Pearl Eliza Christensen Card were goodly parents. They already had two sons, Brigham and Eldon, when Ruth was born in Cardston on June 27, 1917. Next, they had two more sons, Lester and Aaron. Then Ruth finally got her first sister, Rhea. Next came brother Lincoln and finally another sister, Marie, that made eight card children. Theirs was a gospel-centered happy home. Their housing changed as family needs required and finances permitted. The Kazare house was the favorite. J.Y. always made sure that his children had a play yard. Mother always had a flower garden and the whole family kept the vegetable garden. Ruth remembers, I never heard a disagreement between my parents. If my brothers wanted to tease or fight, they were set outside. Contention was not a part of our home. I am so very thankful for the wonderful example and teachings of goodly parents. In the eighth grade, she had N. Eldon Tanner as her teacher. She says that was the best thing that could have happened to me. He gently but firmly helped me to see my true worth and set me on the forward path. It was in his class that I discovered I could paint and also discovered that I could memorize pages and then close my eyes and read them in my mind. When Ruth was 18, she was accepted at the LDS Hospital Nursing School in Salt Lake City. Her mother was one of the early nursing graduates of the LDS Hospital and she had admired her for years. After becoming a registered nurse, Ruth went down to BYU and took a position as assistant school nurse. It included tuition-free classes. She soon discovered that advanced sewing and nutrition classes included few men. The next quarter, she switched to chemistry and microbiology, and she says, that greatly expanded my chances to meet a good man. I wanted to find an eternal companion who was a good man with a strong testimony, energetic, goal-oriented, with a congenial personality and a sense of humor. It would also please me if he was a returned missionary, enjoyed good music, the great out of doors, and could ballroom dance. It was in the late fall of 1939 when she was taking sick call at the BYU Medical Office that this nice-looking older student came and kept moving to the end of the line. His courtesy impressed her. Finally, he was the only student left and she asked how she could help him. He introduced himself as Will Ashby, who had just returned from France. Her brother Brigham, who was Will's missionary companion, sent his regards and asked that he convey them. Before she could question him, he whirled on his heel and was gone. Their first date was almost a disaster. Ruth had neglected putting Frank Springer's name on her calendar and promised that same dance to Will. Both showed up. Will discovered that Frank was there to date Ruth. He winked at her, said nothing, and disappeared behind a newspaper until they left. Then Will persuaded one of her roommates to go with him to the dance. They made it a foursome, and Frank never knew what a blunder she had made. Will Vera gallantly saved her from embarrassment and proved himself a real gentleman. She was dating several fellows, but Will was different. Almost every date was some sort of test as well as something special. It was intriguing to her to see if she passed. He was most interested in hereditary characteristics, likes and dislikes, goals, prevalent health qualities, etc. One of her most impressive evenings with Will was when he took her to American Fort to meet his mother and family. The love and respect he showed for his wonderful little mother made Ruth think even more highly of him. Ruth made a list of what she really wanted in her husband and measured her dates against it. Will came out on top. Having thought it out in her mind, she then asked the Lord if it was right. Confirmation came in his behalf. They became engaged in June and celebrated by going to American Fort to tell his parents. In post-war Utah, jobs became scarce and they decided to move to Connecticut to pursue a possible job with DuPont. When they left Utah, they had four children, son William, Billy, daughter Arda, son Aaron Kay, and son Lynn Eric. The job lead paid off and they spent the next five years in Connecticut growing their family, Nita was born there. Their proximity to New York City was a part of the Lord's wisdom and it saved Billy's life. A rare kidney problem was slowly killing him, but one of the most advanced kidney specialists in the world was there in New York. With the Lord guiding him, he was able to repair Billy's kidneys. DuPont then took them to Wilmington, Delaware for the next three years, and they helped grow the Wilmington branch. In 1961, DuPont transferred Will to their Chattanooga, Tennessee nylon plant. The hills, woods, lakes, rivers, and people of Tennessee won their hearts. They put down roots on a five-acre piece of Tennessee. Will and sons built a lovely home. 
It took a complete family dedication of time, effort, and money for over a year to create their homemade home. It sits one mile from Chickamauga Lake for swimming and sailing and, oh yes, baptizing, since there was no font in the Chattanooga Branch's first phase chapel. Ruth's job as school nurse at Brainerd High School made it so the children could continue attending choice schools because she was a faculty member. During Ruth's time at Brainerd High School, she was instrumental in sharing the gospel with some students and faculty members. Will frequently worked side by side with an electrical engineer who eventually joined the church with his family. What a blessing and joy. The Ashby's strengthened the little branch and worked hard to help build it into several branches, some of which became wards when the Knoxville stake was created. Will had a terrible accident which crushed both of his knees. He was put in casts from his waist to his ankles. When he was released to come home, Ruth was his primary caregiver. She did most of the lifting and turning of him while his legs knitted back together. It would be six months before he would learn to walk again. Many friends helped Will and Ruth during this challenging time. All of her children earned college degrees. The four oldest were sealed to their spouses by priesthood authority. Daughter Ida is still single. All served faithfully in the church. Parental examples gave them good direction. Symptoms of Parkinson's disease were becoming obvious in Will. 1980 and 81 became a time to catch up on family visits and health concerns incident to Ruth and Will going on an official mission for the church. They were sent to Miami where they worked among the refugees from Haiti. They made many choice friendships and witnessed many miracles. Will was still having trouble with his knees and Ruth brought her RN training to his aid over and over. They spent 18 months in Miami. One highlight was their trip to Haiti with Elder Thomas Monson when he dedicated Haiti for the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Besides the dedication services, they got to visit many of the families of the people they had taught in Miami. Will and Ruth applied to be missionaries again. This time the call to serve was to Mauritius, a small volcanic island in about the middle of the Indian Ocean, just about exactly on the other side of the world from Chattanooga. Preparations were made and another mission was filled. They thought they were through serving missions, but the call came to them to serve as stake missionaries to the South Pittsburgh branch, which was very small and struggling. They responded as they always did with all the energy and resources they could bring to bear. They rented a house in South Pittsburgh so they could be more available to help the members. When they were released from their stake mission, they moved to Troy, Alabama to help Aaron raise his boys since his dear Sylvia couldn't. Trips to see loved ones took up a lot of their remaining time. Weariness, hospital stays, and doctor's visits took the rest. Will's last three years in mortality were filled with difficulty and challenges. Besides the Parkinson's disease, which was steadily advancing, he had a stroke which left him partially paralyzed. Ruth, at age 80, once again called upon her abilities as a nurse to care for him. With help from friends and family, she was able to do it. So Will was able to live at home until he died in November of 2000 from another stroke. Ruth decided that while she had strength and resources, she would spend her time going to see friends and family and letting them know that she loves them. She has made several trips and written several inspirational books to do that. Now she is weary in body and mind as she approaches her 100th birthday, but she is excited about renewing friendships as she celebrates that milestone. Ruth is really a sweet, kind uh, lady. I never saw her turn her back on anybody. She was always willing to help. She smiles a lot, so you feel really relaxed around her and just a person that you'd really like to talk to. I can't ever remember seeing her, being around anyone that she wasn't tremendously upbeat. She never had a, a, a downside to her character. She's just a sweet lady that you just enjoy being with and enjoy talking to. She's very soft-spoken, which I think has served her well as a mother and as um, a nurse. When you talk to her, you knew she was listening, or when you do talk to her, you know she's listening to what you say. She's able to just zone in on you. She would never push anybody away because of behavior or whatever. She would teach them. 
I was impressed with uh, her and Bill serving a mission after they got older. Uh, that was part of the incentive for my wife, Georgia, and I to go on a mission because we had them for our example. They would serve wherever they were needed. I met Ruth in 1973 when I first started coming to Chattanooga Ward uh, investigating the church. And um, I was separated and going through a divorce and I had three young children and Bill and Ruth both were so helpful and they were trying to fellowship all of us. And my youngest child, he got tossed from one to the other and Bill and Ruth, you know, they, they really showed a lot of love for my children. And they were almost like extra grandparents. And um, so I really appreciated that fill in with their dad being gone and I just felt at home. After church, well, a lot of times she would invite us home with her. And uh, we would sit and talk about the church and play church games and, uh, uh, and just have a visit and have a good time. And when we'd leave, well, we would be just super happy. She's had her ups and downs and trials, just like all of us. But through it all, she's, she's maintained her testimony. She's maintained her personality. She is really spiritually minded, and it's very natural for her to just share her testimony in any conversation. Because of Sister Ashby and Eric in particular, that I'm, I'm in the church. Um, and every day I'm grateful for their willingness to share the gospel. I think in, in my life I've had a very few instances where I feel like I have known an elect lady, and I feel like Ruth Ashby is one of those people. She's an elect lady.